Hi everyone, it's Professor Chu, and it being now the fifth week of our class with our midterm coming up in the seventh week, I've had a lot of questions about the midterms. So let's talk about what's gonna be on it, since we're almost resolved about getting everyone to actually come on campus at, in the College Avenue campus in New Brunswick to take it. So uh, I'm also gonna talk a bit about what lies ahead of us for the next couple weeks of class. So the first thing to note is that this is week five. Okay. The first thing to note is that once again for week five, we're doing two units, lesson seven, building Greek vocabulary, and lesson eight on Latin nouns and adjectives. Notice that in lesson six, we are reviewing lesson eight. Lesson eight is one of the uh, most packed lessons of the textbook because it introduces something entirely new, which is Latin nouns and adjectives. Um, that is why we are starting on this unit um, in week five, and we're going to carry over our study of it into week six. Um, regarding lesson uh, seven, it is a very straightforward unit, and um, as you will see, um, it basically gives you more uh, medical terms based on Greek. So um, lesson seven is basically a vocabulary building unit, and um, I won't have really too much more to have to tell you about that. Um, but as you can see, it is also the last lesson um, that is at the end of this section about Greek-derived medical terminology. So um, if you take a quick, uh, taking a quick look at lesson seven, um, basically lesson seven consists of vocabulary to learn. I think some things that you've gotten familiar with now, namely some um, combining forms as, or bases that sometimes end in a vowel, sometimes don't, like uh, Kelly, which can abdomen, or um, kyle uh, or kill, which can mean a lip, um, with or without this e, class or class, which can mean to break up or destroy, as in polyoclastic or icotoclast. Um, and then some uh, terms that are related, like desis and desm, um, both of these refer to binding. Um, desm, -E des, mm, <laughs> refers to a ligament, uh, for instance. And uh, notice for these two terms, they are related. Isk, I-S-C-H and S-C-H-E, both meaning to suppress or to check as in ischemia, um, but they are related even though one starts with an I, one starts with an S. Uh, and I hope that you, before you are doing the homework, you are really going over this list and even maybe writing it out by hand once. That's a good technique to do for studying for the midterm, but also to help you, I think, on your homework. Um, if you look at the next um, part of the vocabulary, um, well, uh, a number more words that begin with a P, you can tell that's a popular letter in Greek, um, including, uh, yes, uh, two words for spit or saliva, you know, kind of interchangeable, um, PTY, PTYAL, a word for suture, R-R-H-A-P-H, -H. so if you see this um, base on homework, the two R's stay together, don't separate them, and uh, you should definitely look at these notes in these boxes. Uh, plasti is the frequently occurring ending, meaning um, a uh, plastic or restorative, or restorative surgery, as in rhinoplasty. And tropism, as it says, it refers to the turning of living organisms towards something or away from. You should still break up these um, forms on the homework, but they do occur commonly. So plast is the base here, and the Y is the suffix. Trop is the base. Ism is the suffix. And then also another note that some of... Um, this little box here tells you some suffixes that are often used for instruments. Um, lithoclast with clast, um, stat as in hemostat, and that measures something, a cephalometer or tome is something that cuts. So this, in other words, this um, suffix or uh, ending, this uh, <laughs> ending, shall we say, um, tome um, is, is related to the compound suffix forms ectomy and tomy. Ectomy meaning to cut into, a surgical procedure to cut into. Tomy meaning a surgical procedure involving an incision. And then the rest of the cap vocabulary is some vocabulary uh, chapters, some vocabulary notes, which I think you can handle. Now, the more um, fun, uh, so to speak, part of this chapter is actually about Latin-derived medical terminology. So um, what I... Um, this is, I think, uh, the first unit after a nice little um, box containing some information about Roman numerals, which is not going to be required for you to know, but if you want to learn those, I strongly encourage it, especially at least learning up to um, this column over here. C is 100, D is 500, M is 1,000, MM is 2,000. 
Um, the chapter we're really going to be focusing on um, for week five is Latin nouns and adjectives. And the book gives a quite, I think, extensive overview about Latin grammar and also how it's used in medical terminology. And of course, I want you to read the book or at least to look it over. Um, especially what's helpful is that they list a lot of Latin nouns, some of which are actually used, um, come right into English and are used as words. Um, however, the book offers a pretty comprehensive grammatical explanation, which I think um, is not entirely clear. So I have actually written up some notes for you. And um, I really encourage you to read the notes first um, and then uh, to look at the chapter. So let's take a look at those notes. Okay, so you can access the lecture notes that I wrote for you by, um, I have the long link here. Um, and again, I use these Google, long Google Doc URLs because um, when I upload PDFs of things onto Sakai, not everybody seems to access, be able to access them depending on how your Sakai is set up, et cetera. So making life easier for me, hopefully for you. Okay, so let both lessons eight and nine, nine we'll do after the midterm, root words, prefixes, and suffixes from Latin, and I've highlighted the main points uh, to know. Um, before we get into this grammatical explanation, um, one reason we have to learn a little bit about Latin grammar is that a number of Latin words are actually used in English, and as a result, um, they are they still follow some latin grammatical rules even though they're used in english so that is why i have to go i want to go over a little bit of latin grammar with you um, but these words include some medical terms that i think are probably familiar fungus fistula bursa vagina tibia cerebellum cervix corpus callosum the medulla the omblongata medulla omblongata testes the pons oris externa rotix um, and I should also note that there are a lot of non-medical terms that are originally Latin words that have come into English, like data, which is the correct pronunciation in Latin. It means having been given. Crux, which really means a cross. Janitor, yes, it originally just means like um, somebody who's a guard. Ratio, reason, labor, terror, I'm using a Latin pronunciation here. Minimum, ego, I, opera, works. Compus, yes, a Latin word. So um, it's good to know a few rules about Latin because, as it says here in my notes, um, sometimes for many of these words, their plural forms, so singular here versus plural, is are formed according to rules in Latin, not according to English. Um, first thing to note too, Latin nouns can have one of three genders. They can be masculine, feminine, or neuter. A suffix ending in us, if it's from a Latin word, that denotes a masculine gender word. Um, a denotes a feminine gender word, and um or um denotes a Latin word in the neuter gender. This is important because all of these different uh, genders of Latin nouns form their plurals differently. So, for instance, if you wondered, uh, you know, when you were taking um, science class in high school, why is the plural of a larva larvae? It's because larva and also bursa are in La are from Latin, they're Latin words. These uh, bursa and larva, those are feminine words because they ended in A, and they form their plurals by adding AE. And in Latin, we pronounce that ending as in long I sound, bursae, larvae. However, sometimes in English, uh, the AE is pronounced as an E sound, bursae, larvae, but I think it's more common to say larvae. So feminine, singular, A, feminine, plural, ending, AE. Masculine, singular, Fungus, U.S. ending, masculine plural ending is an I. Again, in aviolus here, we see the same thing, the U.S. and then the I. So fungus, fungus, one fungus, more than one fungi, fungi, aviolus, avioli. <laughs> um, in Latin, uh, the neuter uh, gender is noted with this U.M. So an ovum is one egg, ova is many eggs. A is the plural form, and yes, this is the A is, in other words, both the ending for a neuter plural noun, and it can also be the ending for a feminine, sing feminine singular noun. I don't think this is going to be too much of a problem for you, at least for this class. Um, if you were taking Latin, yes, it does present some challenges, but um, um, we don't need to worry quite that much about it. 
So that's the basics. However, nothing is ever as simple as one wants it to be. In Latin, um, there are there's more than one way to have, shall we say, a noun that has a masculine gender, feminine gender, or a neuter gender. In other words, um, as the book points out actually in a little chart, going to the book here. Uh, let's see, do I take you to a textbook? So uh, here, looking on page 88, um, basically there are, the different groups of nouns in Latin have different sorts of endings. I mean, the uh, nouns can be determined based on their gender, um, but there are different sets of endings for Latin nouns. Maybe that's the best way to put it. And um, there are nouns that can be in what's called the first declension, nouns that can be in what's called the second declension, and nouns that can be in what's called the third declension, and the fourth declension, and the fifth declension. You really just need to know about the first three. You don't even need to know a ton about those. Um, and that nouns in the third declension, okay. That's the book's explanation. The book basically lists here, there are these three declensions, have different endings of some sort. Explain what that genitive thing is in a moment. Um, but looking over this chart in the book on page 89, so um, the book lists that there are indeed the first and second declensions, this thing called the third declension, and then the fourth declension, fifth declension. Basically, this means that there's these different categories of nouns. So we already looked at these words, fungus, larva, and ovo, looked at their plurals. The other type of nouns that you're going to see in medical terminology are nouns from what's called the third declension. The third declension nouns can be uh, nouns like the word uh, carvitz, meaning the neck, or viscous, meaning the intestines. Um, this uh, curvix is actually um, a, mass, is a feminine noun, and the plural for it is actually es. And also there's a bit of a change in the stem of the word. In the, it's no longer curvix, it's curvy case. So there's an ES or viscous. That US, yes, I know it, it says here that it's a masculine singular ending, but it can also be a neuter singular ending. Don't worry about that. It's a bigger problem if you're taking Latin. It's not a problem. Um, viscous, though, uh, becomes the plural form. It has a different stem, viscera is the plural. Um, the fourth declension, okay, another sort of ending that now that has a U-S ending. And um, again, uh, these kinds of words though are actually, believe it or not, not quite as common. And the other good thing about these words, if you do run into a fourth declension or fifth declension, Latin now that's being used in English, like rabies, which would actually pronounce rabies in Latin, well, the singular and the plural are the same. So you don't really have to worry about that too much. There's a little change of the plural here for this word for knee. But basically, I would advise you to, well, number one, if this, uh, if this, if these technicalities are confusing you, that is entirely understandable because I vary in presenting this material between telling you a lot about Latin grammar and uh, kind of like overdoing it or telling you just enough to, that I think you that helps you know, but let me know if you need more of an explanation to do the homework, understand the vocabulary. Anyways, so oh, these are actually third declension nouns. Uh, testis, the, the singular is is, the plural is testes with an es. Viscous, well, the plural is this a, intestine and testes. And again, for some words in the fifth declension in Latin, like rabies or rabies in Latin, the plural and the singular are the same. Okay? So that's, the, the again, the main reason for to tell you these rules that Latin nouns are masculine, feminine, and neuter, which is the same actually for Greek, is because some, in fact, quite a few uh, Latin nouns are used in English. And it's much more common to see Latin nouns that are used directly in English because with Latin, there is no difference or interest in the alphabet. Um, Greek alphabet, um, words written in Greek have to be transliterated into Latin letters. Um, the other thing, there's a few other things to note about Latin nouns, namely that in order to show how a noun is used in a sentence, the ending of the word is changed. Um, so this means that basically you mostly see forms like the ones up here. Um, if you see a Latin noun that's used in English, but occasionally you'll see a noun that has been something called declined. A noun that is declined has been put into a different case. 
Um, by putting it into a different case in Latin, we show that it's used differently in a sentence. Um, what that does for you is it probably confuses you because you think, okay, I thought I learned, for instance, well, you think I thought I learned one thing and now what you're telling me is something else. So in Latin, there's something called the genitive case. Um, genitive case means when I put a certain ending on the back of on the end of a noun, it adds a sense of possession to it. Um, it has an of meaning. So for instance, take this noun caput, which means the head, um, and the noun corona, which means a crown. Well, the genitive form of caput is capitis. The is is the ending, the capit is the stem. So this word literally means the crown, the corona of the head, top of the head, because capitis is in what we call the genitive case. Um, so there are a couple of these uh, sort of pairs of um, nouns in Latin uh, or in medical terms, um, that is to say, that are in Latin and that have a, a, a noun followed by a genitive noun. So cervix means the, na the neck, and then uteri is in the genitive, it's the neck of the uterus. Icterus is jaundice, nea naturum, that is also a genitive form, that is the jaundice of newborns. Now, there are a limited number of words like this. I mean, what's more important for you to focus your memorizing energy on is on learning, as always, the vocabulary and the really fun and wonderful list of prefixes that um, and suffixes that are used in lesson eight. But I just wanted to guide you a little bit more through the textbook. So basically, you don't need to worry about memorizing the information on these charts in the book. These stuff, material I have in our um, lecture, my lecture notes is really what you need to learn. Um, backing up a little bit. Okay, so, um, but if you are curious and you think Latin looks really interesting, um, just so you know what the charts in the books are, the book also has a chart about the genitive endings. It has some of the words that we had here. Uteri is of the uterus, neonatorum is of newborns, dentist is of the tooth, so um, if you were, so there are really not a lot of words, uh, so in your homework, that use any of these genitive forms, but um, may I point you to one that you might encounter on your homework? If you had to break down a word like this, well, care what you leave it alone, but you can break down uterus, for instance, into uter and e because that would denote the genitive ending. I'm not sure I can do that here. Oh, I'm on view only. Um, you would break down, I'm not gonna worry about that. Um, you would break down this word, icterus neonatorum, um, with uh, this stem is actually here. The genitive ending is orum. And for corona capitis, the stem is here. The genitive ending is the is. So here, I will highlight the stem. Stem for that, this is the genitive, so you break it down between the T and the I. This word you would break down between the R and the I. And this word you break down between uh, neonat and orum. But there are not a lot of words like that. I just wanted to let you know to alert your attention to them if you see them and to understand why you translate the second word with the of. Uh, once again, in Latin as in Greek, uh, one base can have more than one form. And this is because of this um, business about declining. When you decline a word, sometimes uh, the base is the stem that you use to, to decline the word is the same as the um, nominative form or the main form, but sometimes it's different. So you can have bases from Latin nouns like gen and gener, meaning kind or birth, or rodic, rod and rodics, these all mean root, or sangui and sanguin, those all mean blood. Or um, in terms of adjectives, integer and into whole, like integers, and solibera, solid for healthful. Okay, so in other words, there's a lot of variety in other words that you're going to see with Latin nouns. Um, one quick grammatical explanation, if you will allow me, um, before we talk about prefixes and suffixes. Um, this business of inflection is very important in Latin. If you didn't do it, you have no idea how to read a sentence in Latin. And again, so the basic idea in Latin is that when you change the ending of a word, so you go from the word for dog is canis to canis, 
you know, it's the same word because you have the con stem. The is indicates it's singular, the ace that it's plural. Um, Canis current is the dog runs, but canes current, so I've changed the ending of my verb to from it to unt is the dogs run. So it's a little bit different than it is in English, where uh, we have to put the words in a certain place to know how they're used in a sentence. In Latin, you change the endings of words, and that shows you how a word is used. For instance, um, you could say, canem video. This is, I see, the word is video. The dog, canem. So the I see is the verb. It's the part of the word that's doing something. Kanem, on the other hand, describes the direct object, namely who is receiving the action of the verb. Um, and notice that in Latin, I can put my direct object in front of my verb, as I did here, or I can put my uh, my uh, noun um, in be. Uh, I could put the direct object also behind the verb, and I would still have a Latin sentence. It's because we change the endings of the. Latin nouns um, that we can do this. So um, it's one reason that if you ever study Latin, uh, Latin has an incredible flexibility as far as where you can put words in a sentence with wonderful implications for poetry. Um, this we did may, the dog sees me, um, a little bit more Latin grammar. So this is the word for dog. It's in what we call the nominative case. This is the verb, we did, and may, which looks not like the English word for me, is what we call the direct object. It's in what, it's in what is called the accusative case. Um, there can be adjectives. Canis fortis, brave dog, helps the boy. Um, so notice you can put the adjective behind the noun. It doesn't affect the meaning, and that's actually more common in Latin to put the adjective behind the noun. And uh, there's also no word for the in Latin. Um, Canis, magnus, uat, puerum, parum. Uh, so here we have a sentence where we have magnus is this adjective. It's describing the dog. Um, they actually have slightly different endings. One is is, one is us, but I know because I've memorized this that they're both nominative. Here's my verb, uat, puerum, parum. This means a, a small boy. The um and the um match. So I know that the word parum is describing the boy. Um, this is like first day of Latin class. <laughs> um, but the main thing for you to get out of this is that Latin nouns and verbs actually, their meaning in a sentence shifts based on their endings. Um, there are many sets of endings for nouns in Latin. They're grouped into something called declensions. And there are many different sets of endings. I will fix some of these typos. Um, for verbs, uh, these are called conjugations. Um, so that's kind of your Latin grammar lesson, um, which doesn't impinge on your performance in medical terminology, as far as I can tell from teaching some Latin grammar um, and um, teaching medical terminology. But I think it's helpful to know in case you're wondering why in the world do these you know, endings seem to keep changing. Uh, more uh, practical stuff. Um, in Latin, when you break, uh, so Latin terms, uh, connecting vowels, uh, up till uh, lesson seven, the only word we had, the only vowel we really had for connecting vowels was O, but now we can also use I and U. So life got a little bit more complicated there. And then, and then, okay, the other uh, fun part of this, uh, of lesson eight is that there's a whole bunch of new prefixes and suffixes to learn. Um, and this, in some ways, um, along with the grammatical uh, information, is one of the most exciting parts of Lesson 8. Um, maybe you don't think it's so exciting. Um, I went over the adjectives, I will note, because there are a few medical expressions in which we do have a noun, like neasthenia, meaning weakness, of the weakness, lack of strength of the muscles, are attached with an adjective, or the vena cava. Um, and if you're wondering how can you have this adjective with the is going with this noun with the a, that's because they are both in the nominative case. Um, there are reasons, in other words, in Latin that you can put miasthenia with gravis and know that the, this adjective describes this noun. But getting on without further ado to all these new prefixes. So yes, there is a long list of new prefixes to learn um, here on pages 90 through 91, as you can see. 
Um, the book gives you an example uh, that the words are used in. Notice that the prefix in has three different meanings. In or into, in meaning not, yes, in can be not, and in being meaning very or thoroughly. Also, please take a, no a moment to look at the, all the stuff in parentheses here. So in other words, when you're making flashcards about these prefixes, don't just make the flashcards about, you know, in. You also need to note the alternate forms because they definitely occur in Latin. For instance, you will say in, but you will see it becomes I-L before I, the L, I-M before B-P and uh, B-M and P and I-R before R. I don't think you need to worry about memorizing the business about before L, before B, P, M, R, etc. But just know that in, ill, im, and er, are, these are all forms of in. They have these three meanings. Um, it's my hope that will stand you well. Or for instance, ob, which means against. Um, can be also be OC and OP. So we see that, for instance, we have the word obsession uses this prefix, but also occult, something secret, the B changes to C, and opposition, the B changes to AP. Um, looking back on the first page of the prefixes, ob, which means away from, also becomes an A or can become obs as an absent. And then uh, be very careful because ob, a preposition that means away from, well, there is also a preposition. Um, lost my space. There is also a preposition that means. Let's see my Latin prefixes. Um, there's also a preposition meaning. Da -da 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 -da. There's uh, towards. That preposition is ad, a d. So it's very similar to the one meaning away from. And it also has a number of other alternate forms, which I advise you strongly to write down on a flashcard if you're making flashcards. AD could be AC, AF, AG, AL, et cetera, AM, AP, AS, A, and AT. I really recommend you write all this down because as you see, um, this, premise, this prefix meaning to or toward is used in all of these different English words, even appendix, aspirate, assist. Um, we also hit the prefix bi, as in uh, bisexual or bi bicycle. You can also have the form of bin or bis. And the prefix con, which is from the Latin, a Latin uh, preposition cum, meaning with, as in cum laude or summa cum laude or magna cum laude. Those all mean with praise, with great praise, the greatest praise. Um, con also has other forms, co, col, com, etc. Learn those too. Then there is also a list of suffixes, not quite as many new uh, suffixes as there are new prefixes to learn, um, and they don't have as many alternate forms, but they should certainly also be learned, at least for the assignment uh, for this week and also for the quiz. Then, on top of all that, <laughs> Make sure you read this little box here and this explanation about diminutive suffixes. Um, students in the past have looked this over and had a lot of trouble on the homework. Um, but basically, there's a whole other set of suffixes that when you add them to the end of a Latin word, uh, they are, well, as it says here, they're characterized by the presence of a single or a double L. So they all, in other words, all of these suffixes contain either one L or two. Okay. <laughs> Got that. Um, but they also uh, convey, as it says, an idea of smallness. And I think you can get a little bit of an idea of how these uh, suffixes work if you look at these words. Here, for instance, the cerebellum um, is uh, actually formed by adding a diminutive suffix to um, the word for head. So it's a small head. Or um, a ventricle is a little vent. Or ventriculus. Rubella is a little red thing, um, referring to, um, as it says, as it says here, rubella means little red things. Um, the German measles, roseola are, would mean little reddish things. The ola is diminutive, rose uh, means red. Um, that refers to the uh, condition of roseola. Or the varicella, the chickenpox uh, vaccine. Um, is actually, um, as it says here, a diminutive uh, form from variola, 
from which is from varius, which means spotted. So varicella referred to the fact that chickenpox is little spots, which is certainly what that unfortunate disease of childhood looks like. Don't remind me of it. Awful. Missed two weeks of school in the second grade. Uh, my son instead had the uh, chickenpox vaccine, so he still got the chickenpox, but it was probably the mildest case ever. Probably like five. Um, anyway, so that helps you remember chicken pox or it helps you remember diminutive suffixes, uh, so be it. I do read this section about diminutive suffixes, and I do encourage you to add these diminutive suffixes, suffixes here to your list. I know your ever-growing list of things to memorize. So uh, just going back to the lecture notes, because I do actually have all this information. So on the lecture notes, OK, I've added all the prefixes here. I kind of slimmed it down so you don't have all that stuff around. Um, namely, I added all the alternate forms and meaning. And I also have added here on my lecture notes um, an English word, not necessarily a medical term that uses uh, the prefixes. Um, I think actually that. In addition to memorizing the prefixes cold, ob, odd, obbi, ante, by, kerku, con, contra, etc., it is helpful to memorize them on a word. Especially, um, that's why we did some of those medical tips uh, for our forum posts um, this uh, week. Um, and um, you know, I, I did that post because I because I was getting a lot of questions about how do I study for the midterm and hoping we could pull together some knowledge and some techniques for memorizing some of these words. Because yes, you need to know all the vocabulary for the midterm. Um, just a few notes. You don't, there is a list of number prefixes definitely for the midterm. You don't need to know these. Um, you do need to know them for the homework and for the final exam, but the midterm, I know we're approaching memorization, the peak memorization uh, capacity here, probably in your brain. So um, there's a list of suffixes, again, with a word they uh, are used in that's common, like airy means a place for something, as in library. Um, or L is pertaining to as a neurological or spiritual. Um, or Os, well, bellicose means full of war or aggressive. So again, it's helpful to memorize uh, a suffix or a prefix attached to a noun. And then in the end of my lecture notes, my endless lecture notes, um, section about these diminutive suffixes that we just looked at, like varicella, roseola, um, and uh, what I did here is I simply listed all of the diminutive suffixes in bold. Uh, and listed also some English words that, believe it or not, come out of them. Uh, so CLE gives us words like ventricle, oracle, muscle. It means actually a little mouse. The idea that, you know, when you're flexing your muscle, you actually see a little mouse running into your skin. That's apparently what ancient people thought. I certainly don't. Um, Coolus is a diminutive form. It gives us words like homunculus, a little human, or caniculus, which means, yes, a rabbit. And I have used it in teaching middle schoolers uh, Latin uh, to be guinea pig. Why not? <laughs> wrote it in a cage in a classroom. We did caniculus. Um, IL, uh, another diminutive, uh, seated words like pupil, nostril, so these little parts of your body, etc. Elus, ul, ulus, and olus. Uh, and then I added this list of diminutive suffixes in English just so you can compare. Like in English, we add let to words like, you know, piglet is a small pig, a booklet is a small book. Uh, you know, in, in Italian, ini means little, like, you know, zucchini is really a little squash from zucca, a big squash. And in German, chen and lein. So, you know, das Brotchen is a bread roll, a little bit of bread. Das Fraulein is a, is a little, little Frau, die Frau. Uh, Frau is woman, Fraulein is miss. Finally, yes, end of the lecture notes. The word caput. So caput means head in Latin. Uh, it has its alternate form, its genitive stem is capit. And it is the really this alternate form that you see in English words like capital, meaning the most important, like the head city of a state or a country, um, but also refers to capital punishment. Yes, in other words, a very serious crime, one that you will lose your head for, as in the word decapitation, decapitation or capital, a building where the head or leader of a government meets. Uh, finally, uh, is one of the words on the lesson eight homework. However, there is another base that looks remarkably similar to it, and I'm going to warn you about it in advance. It is kept. Um, no, forget what I just said. 
thinking about a totally different Latin word. I had, I started to do Latin in my head, not medical terminology. I totally apologize. These are just other forms of copy. Don't worry about that other form. I think that's in lesson nine, getting ahead of myself. Okay, copet is such an exciting word. It's such an important word that it has other forms. Copet, caps, kip it, kip it, kip it, Okay, so take a list of this list of words. It will make you much happier before you do the homework, I promise. There are some questions on the homework that use some of these forms. They're not highlighted in the book. And if you really, if you look at these lecture notes and listen to me going on and on like this, um, hopefully it will actually help you in this week's uh, homework. But anyways, uh, you also see forms of copet meaning ahead in these other words, like biceps, quadriceps, a capital. Um, and I'm sorry again if I mispronounce things. I'm pronouncing them as I would in Latin. Um, sync, um, sync, um, center put. Okay. <laughs> so in other words for this week, make sure you read those lecture notes. Um, the link is there for you and will make you hopefully much happier than otherwise. Okay. Finally, once again, what is the midterm on? I've been asked this question, which is a very valid question to ask because it is coming up. It's in week seven. So if you go to the week seven page on Saka, you will see a complete comprehensive list of what is on the midterm. The top is the dates and the times, which um, almost everybody, thank you so much, has committed to. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm sorry I had to make the Thursday exam 15 minutes earlier. The reason for this was that the secretaries um, told me that there was not a room available from 9 to 11.30, but I can get one from 8.45 to 11.15 a.m. Yay. Um, so I will be I will be at all the exams on Thursday. My class's grad student named Scott will be at the Tuesday exam, and he has been instructed he will give me the exams uh, to pick up in the classes department office on Thursday, so I will get your uh, exam and start grading it. Um, and then on Saturday, my husband, a Ford professor, Rutgers alum, James T. Fisher, is going to be proctoring the exam, and then he's going to the football game. So he's not bringing the exams to the football game, as far as I know. He's not grading them. He teaches theology and American studies and American religion at Fordham. Um, what's on the exam? Uh, well, uh, there's going to be 78 questions. And, uh, there's going to be three matching sections. One section will be on vocabulary, on all the bases from lessons one through eight. There will be a section on prefixes. Those will be from lessons one through eight. It will be weighted much more heavily towards the prefixes and suffixes we learned in lessons one and two. Um, but we are, uh, you know, we do have an extra week after starting the um, chapter in uh, lesson eight. So some of the uh, material from lesson eight is going to be on the midterm. Um, there will certainly be more of an emphasis, though, of the material from lessons uh, one through seven. And there's a section on medical definitions where I give you a whole bunch of medical terms and um, you tell me what they mean based on some definitions that I provide for you. There's going to be a word analysis section. I give you 30 words. You have to break them down. Then out of those 30 word analysis words, you can choose any 10 of those words, no more, no less, and explain the definitions to me. And I give some examples of definitions here. Um, namely that, you know, if this is the actual definition, you know, bradyarrhythmia refers to heart rate of less than 60 beats per minute found in an adult. Well, you really wouldn't get that exactly from just looking at what the word elements in this word are, a condition of being slow and lacking in rhythm. The top definition here is totally fine, acceptable, full credit and all that good stuff uh, on the midterm. Um, Closer in the, during week six, you will magically see some study guides appear. I will provide you with uh, the quizzes that we've taken on lessons one through eight so you can practice them. Um, I've since students in the past have said that was a good way for them to uh, get ready for the quiz. I mean the midterm, excuse me. Um, and then I also give you a big vocabulary list that has all the prefixes, suffixes, and compound suffix forms and bases on it. Um, that's coming up. Um, during week six, we're not going to cover any new material in this class. We are going to have a homework assignment and a quiz that will help you review, I hope. Um, one part of the homework will probably be heavily based on word analysis, so you can practice breaking down words. And uh, and I pro what I'll do is I'll have words on that uh, homework that were from lessons one through eight, so you can really practice everything again. And then uh, the quiz will, I'm thinking of making it a massive vocabulary quiz where uh, you know there is some vocabulary uh, from all the different units. Um, 
And um, I mean, if this doesn't sound like a good idea to you, uh, let me know. But the reason for this is so you can get a little practice before the midterm, because the one challenge about the midterm is that it is longer and uh, there's a lot more on it than on the quizzes. So most of you I've noticed take about, or give or take to take the quiz, that's fine. It will probably take you, I would say an hour to 15, hour to 30 minutes to do the midterm. Uh, that seems to be the average for students. Most students don't need two hours at all. Um, but you should certainly leave. I would give yourself at least two hours as far as the times. Um, and keep asking me questions about the midterm. I will keep trying to provide you with helpful answers and study guides and other good stuff. Um, and um, um, I just realized I didn't have my screen share on. But once again, um, please go to, please go to, the week seven page to see what's on the midterm and to check the list of times. And really, uh, even though you tell me what time you can come, if at the last minute something happens, you can go to a different time. Um, it'd be great if you could let me know. But um, at the time that you uh, told me you would go to, just because these rooms have somewhat limited capacity. And also, if no, if some of you have told me quite far in advance that you couldn't make any of these dates. So I have uh, when I'm I will actually just be on the Rutgers College Avenue campus in the classics department, um, in the um, in the seminary in the new academic building, um, pretty much all day on Thursday. So you can also stop by there to take the exam and say hello. So keep your questions coming. Keep up the good work. Um, you know, and um, let me know if anything goes awry of you. And uh, thank you for all your hard work. Have a good week.